Are we live on the Facebook page? Yes, we are. Okay, give me a moment and I'm going to share this into the GGC group. If Facebook will allow me. It seems that we are there. It seems that we could be there. <laughs> For anybody tuning in, there's been a bit of tech issues, but we're not going to focus on that. I'm just pinning this to the top of the group. Okay. So welcome everybody uh, to our Glow Live Jason Greystone tonight. I'm absolutely buzzing to talk to Jason. He's an entrepreneur, investor and host of the Always Free podcast, which is fast becoming my new favourite podcast. So we're going to be coming on to that. Let me just make sure that I'm still, yes. Okay, no more tech issues, universe, please. Okay, so Jason, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. Yes, great. Great to uh, to be here. I'm just going to read out a wee bit of background in you, Jason, before we get into it, because I think that this kind of sets the scene a wee bit. Okay. okay. So since starting his first business at 22 years old, Jason's love for investing and business helped him become financially free by the time he was 30 by adopting a unique blend of wealth creation strategies, allowing him to replace his active income. Jason has since built multiple seven-figure businesses, spoken on some of the world's most reputable stages in the investing space, as well as universities, schools, and some large corporations, including the Met Police. Jason runs an industry-leading education program to help people achieve true financial freedom. Financial freedom, that those two words together are magical. They certainly I, I, are. I, they certainly are, and I think at the moment, as we are living through a horrific cost of living crisis and many, most of us, many of us are feeling the pinch, whether we are um, yep. business owners who are having to put our costs up because all of our costs are going up or whether we are, you know, at home or in careers, it just seems like the world has got about 10 times more expensive. So when we started chatting, I thought this is going to be great because Jason, as an expert in his space, is going to come on tonight and share five ways to improve our personal finances in 2024. So I, for one, am buzzing for this. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, tell us, before we get into the strategies, tell us about your journey to yeah. how you've come to the space that you're in before. Because if anybody hasn't or has listened to your podcast, the pilot actually um it's a really, really lovely overview of your life. And I think it really does set the scene of who you are yeah. and where you came from. So can you give us a wee overview of that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, it is an emotive subject. And I think it's uh, it's right that I kind of introduce myself a little bit to get this kind of preconception of, of it's okay for you kind of thing. Because I think a lot of money does trigger a lot of people. There's lots of people in difficult situations right now. Um, so I... I grew up on a council estate in South London called Hatfield Mead. It was just me and my mum. My real dad was a gangster and he got shot and stabbed and then moved to a secret location. Um, I had no real peers or kind of inspirational people to look up to when I was growing up on the estate. And, um, and actually it was on that estate that I changed my mind towards money. So I can't see the chat in the group, but if anyone, if I know you, you're uh, watching it there, Laura, if anyone, you, may I? you know, I wonder who is triggered by money in some way, you know, who gets em emotional talking about money, um, who finds it a very emotive topic. Um, and whilst you're hey. kind of, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm whilst you're firing everyone. that away, uh, I'll share with you what the kind of turning point that I had on the estate. So when I was about 30, well, when I was 13 years old, um, there was every Friday night on the estate, everyone kind of used to congregate around the steps of the foot of my block, uh, you know, for a mother's meeting sort of chin wag type thing. And being the nosy 13 year old kid that I was, uh, I decided to earwig and listen in. And I used to sit there and, everyone used to moan about money all the time. It was just money is evil, rich people are evil, greedy, all this kind of thing, right? And it was like, oh, money's the bane of my life and all this kind of stuff. And everyone would just basically like, you know, explain away the problems. And it was all money related. 
Anyway, at half seven at night on a Friday night, this guy called Roy used to come down from upstairs and he used to collect everyone's money and go and do a syndicate lottery. And as soon as he collected the money, everyone would just talk about how amazing their life would be if they won the money. And I remember thinking, that's weird. You know, I, I didn't have it all sussed out, but I remember thinking they've just like, they think money's horrible. And now they're like, their faces are lit up and they're like saying how amazing their life would be with money. So I didn't think anything of it until that summer when I wanted this mongoose sniper BMX uh, for my birthday and my parents couldn't afford it. So they said, look, we'll give you half the money if you can raise the other half. So in the summer, I basically started washing cars. I went down, I started, I washed the first car and I got paid by this lady called Lynn. She gave me seven pounds. And that night my friend offered to help the next day. And I don't know why, but I gave my dad come in, my stepdad come in my room and he said, uh, I'm going down the shop. Do you want anything? And I gave him all of my earnings for that day, the seven pound. And I said, can you get me another bucket and sponge and a squeegee? And uh, he went and got it. And the next day we washed four cars. And in, it, within four weeks, I had four friends washing cars and I was just knocking on the doors. And there was a moment where I just felt like I'd been lifted 60,000 feet in the air and I, I could see everything clearly. It was like everyone is moaning about money because they, they mustn't be using it right. They mustn't see it for what it is, like a medium for fair exchange. And, you know, if you use it the right way, it can actually give you a lot of options to make your life more inspiring to do more things that you love and less things that you feel like you have to do or, or you should do and uh i remember it was like wow this is a, this is a big turning point for me so ever since then i've had a very different view on money and that essentially went on to allow me to take that into the workforce and you know kind of be very careful with money and very strategic on how i use it and allow me to focus on doing more things that i enjoy which i think is everyone's uh, go in life so that kind of made me think this right it made me see that one you only get money from other human beings right and you only get money in two ways you can either serve someone and they pay you and they get they get a good return and you get paid or you beat them at a game or a skill or boxing or golf or you know trading or whatever it is and you beat them and take their money right and, and that's kind of the only two ways to get money the key is how you use the money when you get it. That's kind of what I'd like to talk about and where we really give you some practical tips on what really changed my life when I was in my early 20s and allowed me to um, basically, you know, uh, match my living costs by the time I was 29 from leverage, passive and semi-passive income streams. So that's kind of a bit of a background on me. And I, I think it's kind of just important to set that just so you don't think I'm a uh, you know, born into a silver spoon type, you know, silver platter type thing. Um, Cause I certainly wasn't. Yeah. The only reason I speak to different to, uh, to my, my parents and my brother and sister is because I'd made a deliberate effort to speak differently to them. <laughs> but I like what you said in your podcast as well about you don't want to be like, you set the scene because you don't want to be sometimes the online gurus, that are you know giving you strategies have not tried and tested them themselves yeah so absolutely. there's not a lot of kind of like integrity behind it but actually you've lived it and what I'm hearing you saying in your story as well is you switched your money mindset around from a really early stage at a time where you're you know your family you weren't being frivolous and if that's maybe the right word like you were you were able to do that at that point because you created what was a wee mini business and that elevated your mindset so how important do you think a money mindset or, or you know if you are feeling negative in a negative space about money because you're fearful how important do you think it is to try and switch that up it's it's the absolute first step you have to take in order to become financially free if you don't believe that some um tool is going to enable you to become free because you've got some limiting belief or some major negative setback in your mind about it, then you're never going to allow it to help you get to where you want to be. And it's this, it's, it's ironic, right? It's like, it's, um, and, it, and it's definitely the number one reason that people don't become financially free, right? So you have to be, you have to have a good mindset around money before you can ever use it to be, to get to where you want. Right. So, 
a lot of that comes down to why do you think it's a negative thing right now set aside all of the kind of cost of living going up and all the rest of it because I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit but just money right money is just a fair tool and the you know if you go back if you go back in in time when it was just pure bartering right money wasn't around and people would say okay well eye for an eye right and they would say well okay you're a dab hand at, um at sewing right and i've spent a long time learning how to perform heart surgery so if my mum needs a heart surgery will you fix my shirt and there's kind of not a fair exchange there right because someone's <laughs> someone has naturally spent a longer amount of time and dedication to develop a skill <laughs> that that person couldn't be bothered to do they just did something a little bit it's still very useful but it's not there's not it's not fair right so there had to be a way of measuring that because there's always going to be some people that want to work harder so if you think about money it's like the best self equilibrating system there is it's the fairest game ever because everyone has got the chance to earn whatever they want and it's just down to what are you willing to do to give value and service to people how much of a difference are you willing to make to their life and how many people can you scale that to? And that's really all it is. That's really all money's for. If you went to a a desert island tomorrow and there was just 500 people on the island and you just had to kind of make it work and it was just a bartering system all over again, what would you do? You'd start looking at some of the problems and, you know, putting your two pence worth in and trying to build the houses and stuff with people and trying to chip in, right? And that would be valuable. So there has to be a figure on that. And that's all money is. And I think a lot of people don't see money as that. They see it as something that's demonic, uh, something that is unfair, when in actual fact, you have to see it as the fairest thing ever, because it, it's like, you know, it's in circulation and you can take as much of it as you're willing, uh, as you're, as you're willing to, to take. Um, you know, when Facebook came about, they you know they didn't just print 30 trillion or 30 billion more for mark zuckerberg it was already there and we just gave most people gave him their money which is why he ends up with 30 billion it, it's not it's a very fair game so why do we why are we negative towards money i would say the first step is to it, uh, here's the thing when you think about money as a negative thing you're thinking about what damage it could do, what it's done in the past and all this, right? Pinpoint what you, why you feel that way. Like, what was it that had that, that made you think that it was negative? It was something that happened to you, something that you saw happen to someone else. Someone lost their house that you loved. Someone, you know, your parents arguing as a, as a kid. I'd love to see the comments in the, in the chat. Um, but what was it? There'll be something there, you know, there'll yeah. be something there. And the reason that you've got a negative mindset towards it is because you didn't see the positives in that situation and people say well there's no positives in that right so think about this anyone in this group i think there's forty thousand people in this group right mm -hmm. um have you ever had an ex-partner <laughs> right if you had an ex-partner when they became your ex i'm sure that there was a point in time, let's just say that you walked in and found them cheating on you, right? And something was, you know, and you was the victim, right? And it was only bad. It was only negative. It was, the, you know, you was the innocent bystander and everything was terrible. And that man's a, or that woman's a evil and all this kind of stuff, right? And at the time, you probably thought that was the worst thing in the world that could happen. And as a result of that, going into the future, you probably had a fear of going out on the dating scene. You probably had a problem trusting people. You probably, uh, you know, took took your time getting into that scene again. And then you kind of skip forward 10 years, five years, 20 years, whatever it might be, 50 years. If I was to ask you if that was a bad thing that happened back then, the chances are you're going to say, no, it's amazing. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because if it wasn't for that, I didn't have my kids now. I wouldn't have traveled, to, done this, that and the other. I wouldn't have met Dave. Or whatever, right? So mm -hmm. imagine if you could see the good in that situation very, very quickly, right? Because the good was always there. 
it just took you five, 10, 20 years to actually see it and appreciate it for what it was. And in actual fact, the event was just the event and it was just a neutral event. So the same with money, whatever you've heard that is negative or whatever you've, whatever words people have thrown at it to give you a false perception of what it is or a negative perception of what it is, is just half true. <laughs> it's only half true. Everything's half true. So there's always going to be a positive side to it as well that you're not seeing. So first thing, the first exercise you can do, I guess this is the first point on the mindset mm -hmm. side of things is if you do have a negative view towards money, write down what those things are. How, you know, what, what, what are your kind of affirmations of money? Is it like money doesn't grow on trees, money, you know, can't buy money, money is time is money, all this kind of stuff, right? Money is the root of all evil, all these kind of things. <clears throat> write them down and then try and think about what event took place in your life where you have evidence of, of that. So a reason to have that view. <clears throat> okay. Once you found that, write down 50 benefits or positives that came out of that event. Because I promise you, as soon as you pinpoint the event, you'll already start to see the positives. It'll be like, oh yeah, you know, I got, uh, I lost my house, but I got closer to my sister and then my sister helped us out. And then we had this opportunity come and then we did this and did that. And, you know, the, the negatives just dissolve away and all of a sudden it's a, it's a, it's a positive event. It's a more positive event. Um, so that's the first step it's, I'm going on a bit of a tangent, Laura. So I'll let you, uh, no, I'm, well, I'm <clears> just <throat> scribbling the note. Cause I'm going to have close cool. this call. I'm going to write down my 50 things. <laughs> <laughs> the reason it's 50 is because when you get to 10, when you get to 10 reasons or 10 benefits, that's quite hard. It's actually quite hard to think of 10 things. Um, when you get to 20, it's almost impossible. It's like, I cannot possibly think of any more positives that came out of this, but then you are, you want to start looking at externals, right. And third parties and butterfly effect and what, you know, keep going and keep going and keep going until you're forcing your brain to write new, literally you write new neural pathways in your brain, new beliefs you create as a, as a result of forcing this subconscious um, effort into writing positives that you didn't see before. So it will completely shift your, your mind, uh, towards money. So that's, that's the first tip. Okay. Amazing. First tip, first tip down. Okay. Second tip. Hit us with it. <laughs> yeah. The second tip, the second tip is how you think about money, right? So how you what you're going to do with it the objective what is the objective and how you use money so it kind of goes back to the first tip where i said i mentioned that people say that time is money okay now i want everyone to just reconsider that statement because if you think time is money what you're going to do is you're going to end up exchanging your time for money and guess what there's only limited time in the day Right. So, I mean, I've lost count the amount of, um, uh, like fitness trainers that I've worked with, um, P PTs, you know, they charge 45 pound an hour and then they're working every hour. Right. And because they raise their living costs with their income, they are no better off than someone earning yeah. 10 pound an hour. And that's, I've seen that through multimillionaires, believe it or not. Um, most people have one month of living costs in the bank. If you stopped your income today, you could live for just under a month before you have to radically change your lifestyle. And that is very, very common. So instead of thinking about time uh, is money, um, think about it as your money being your time, how much time you can buy into the future based on your current lifestyle costs. So there's a calculation that everyone can do, right? Um, and it's this LA, which stands for liquid assets, which is your cash, your savings, your bonds. Um, I don't know any, anything that's liquid, like you could get rid of tomorrow and liquidate. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe you own some Rolexes and some watches. Maybe you own, um, maybe you got a very, maybe you got a load of equity in your house and your house is like on a hot market. 
if it's not on a hot market, it's not liquid because you have to rely on the housing market to sell the thing could take months, right? But any cash that you got, any liquid assets, right? The next part of the formula is LE, which is your living expenses, okay? So what you want to do is add up all of your living expenses. And what I like to do is go through 12 months of living costs and then divide it by 12. And the reason for that is because we all get the one-off like emergency that happens. We get the MOT, we get the vet bills, you know, we get so-and-so's broken leg or whatever. Um, you know, there's all these kind of one-offs that come up in the year that it, you don't really factor into your month-to-month -month expenses. So total spend over 12 months, divide it by 12 and you've got your living expenses. And the last part of the formula is li which is your leveraged income streams and what i mean by leveraged income streams income that comes from you like income that comes in regardless of your space and time so let's let's take covid for example <clears throat> when covid hit a lot of people went remote working and a lot of people felt freer believe it or not even though they were locked in their homes the feeling of freedom came about because they knew that they could do their job remotely now. They were forced, to do, a lot of people were, were forced to do their job remotely. And with that comes this kind of sense of freedom. And the more mobile your income is, and the least time it takes you, the more free you're going to feel, right? So there is a scalability factor to mobility, and there's a scalability factor to passivity. So you might be able to work from home, but can you just work from home? Can you work from any country, any city? Can you work from anywhere in the world, right? Or are there some limitations somewhere where you need Wi-Fi or something, right? So there's going to be a scalability, makes sense? And then passivity is how long the thing takes you to do. So if something takes you eight hours, it's not very passive. But if you could do it in four hours, it's less, it's more passive. And if you could do it in two hours, it's more passive and so on. So you want to think of leveraged income or your income is how can I do it from anywhere and how can I do it in less time? And, and that is a, if anyone's read four hour work week by Tim Ferriss, that's basically the two things he tried to solve in that book. And I, I highly recommend that you read that book. Uh, it's a great book, <clears throat> but COVID solved half the book for us. It was like, everyone's going to work from home. Okay. Or most people. Uh, so that's half the book done. Now, how can we do it in less time? And in the book, he was kind of outsourcing and, spending his money on outsourcing his, his mundane stuff to people, right? To get his freedom back. So leveraged income comes from that. So how much leveraged income have you got coming in right now? A lot, most people at zero. Most people have to go and exchange their time for money at a certain place. And, you know, they have to show up and they get, and they get paid. So the formula is LA divided by LE minus LI. Okay, and I'll give you an example of how that works. Let's just say you've got five grand in the bank and your living costs are 2,000 and you've got zero leveraged income, okay? If you divide 5,000 by 2,000, right, you'll get, uh, sorry, one, it, let's just say it's, yeah, 2,000, you'll get two and a, and a half, right? Two and a half. That means you can buy two and a half months into the future. Make sense? Based on your current lifestyle costs. Mm -hmm. So. If you take that a step further, let's just say uh, still got five grand in the bank, still got two and a half K living costs per month, but this time you're bringing in a thousand a month leveraged. Okay. So through semi-passive income streams. All right. And I'll, I'll explain why this is important in a moment. All of a sudden, if you do the, if you do the formula again, 5,000 divided by 2,000 minus 1,000, the answer is now five right? So you've doubled the amount of time you can buy. Now, the great thing about this formula, and what I'm going to ask you to do in a moment is it's exponential. So let's now say that instead of a thousand pounds a month leveraged income, you're bringing in 1899. So we've just gone up 899, right? The closer you approximate your living costs with your leveraged income, the closer you reach freedom. So if you do the formula there, instead of five months, you've now got 49 months. And if you go up to 1999, I appreciate this is a lot to follow on a live, but you know, you can listen to the recording, then all of a sudden it's 416 years. So the closer you approximate your living costs with leveraged income and you have that bit of liquidity, 
to, to give you a buffer, the quicker you become financially independent, right? You, you become financially free, eternally free. Now notice those numbers, they're not millions. You know, in fact, the less you earn, the easier it is to, to, do, to do these numbers and to reach your goals. So the next step is to get close to your numbers and know where you're at in that formula. And if you want to do it now and put it in the chat, appreciate your honesty. Um, but I highly recommend that you go and do that and get close to your numbers, get close to what it, it where you're at, how much liquid, how much liquid assets you've got, right? How much liquidity you've got, cash, savings, bonds, all these kind of things that you can get your hands on quickly, what your average lifestyle costs are and what your leveraged income figure is right now. Some of you got royalties, some of you got dividends, some of you've got rental income, some of you got none of that. Some of you got online digital businesses that you sell and got some of you got YouTube income, some of you got, you know, you could go on and on with leveraged income streams, but um I'd I'd highly recommend you get close to yours. Make sense? Mm -hmm. It does, yes. I am definitely going to go back over it because numbers are not my forte, but I've got it all down here. So, <laughs> yes. Okay, so leverage income, just obviously you did name a few things there, just in case anyone's thinking to themselves. So just to summarise that again, that's work that you do. You're bringing an income that you can do from anywhere in the world and doesn't take up a lot of your time. So like maybe your, yeah, um, yeah like YouTube income, um, like selling course courses creating a course and selling that yep. that would be passive income and yep. things yeah that investing can... trading, investing, what, trading whatever it is you know it could be rental properties what what i would say is like there's going to be a point where you don't want it to be passive anymore or you don't want it to be any more passive so think about this as we move towards doing more things that we love there's going to be probably two or three things that we just want to do all the time as you move towards that and you can and you can cover your lifestyle costs doing that, then there's actually going to be a point in time where you don't want it to be any more passive. Because let's just say that you just want to spend time uh, with your kids and you love kids, right? Um, imagine that you then create some kind of leveraged income by looking after your kids. It might be a YouTube, it might be a crash, it might be something, right, where you love doing it. Well, then you're going to want to do that anyway, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, you're not trying to escape anything at that point. So therefore, if you can look after kids for four hours a day, that might be the cap. Does that make sense? That might be it for you. That You've made it, right? That is your financial freedom because you've got to the point where you're working the minimal amount of time doing the things that you love and you don't want to do any less than, you don't want to do any less than that because you want those four hours with the kids. So this kind of fantasy that everyone's got that you just want to sit on a beach with some cocktails is like, it's, is that is, that just comes from people who hate their situation they're in right now and they just need a break because it's not real. You're always going to want to be up to something. So the key is to try and mold your life around doing something you enjoy and get paid for it. Because at that point, you're going to want to do that forever. Like there, there is no retirement or like end yeah. goal. It's just, I just want to do this forever. Right. So financial independence is covering your living costs, regardless of a parent, partner, spouse, uh, geographical location, a boss and all that. Right. And that's great. You can get there. And that's a very binary situation to be in. You're either there or you're not. And I'm sure there's people in this group that are there and there's people that aren't right. Complete financial freedom is like phase two. And, and the reason there's two phases is because that first phase is not sustainable because it's still reliant on you. So um, imagine if you had an injury or you become paralyzed, you know, touch wood, you don't obviously, um, or you lost your mind or, you know, something stopped you from being able to be in that position. Well, financial freedom is basically having enough money invested that pays you your lifestyle costs, regardless of you. So that is a, you know, that's a big, that's a big piece of the puzzle. And that's something that you're always, it's dynamically moving because you're always changing your lifestyle, increasing your lifestyle and, and all the rest of it. So that's something that you, you're forever working on. Um, and it's nice to be able to have the choice to stop should you wish, even though you're doing something that you don't want to stop. So these are the kind of hypothetical situations that you want to be thinking about getting 
yourself towards, I guess. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Brilliant. Great. Okay, okay. So are we cool. point three? Point three. So now we're a bit closer to the money. The 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 idea now is um we want to first of all uh clear off any debts. Now I'm not gonna go too much into debts because it's a bit of a you know, it's a bit of a party killer, <laughs> but it is important. And the debts, um, I'll give you two two ways to do that, right? There's two ways. If you've got debts over um if you've got debts over you know nine percent APR, you really want to be thinking about clearing those down. Um, because I see a lot of people trying to go invest their money whilst they've got those debts, and what they don't get is paying down debt is a is investing with a guaranteed return on investment, right? Because you're paying down the debt and and that you don't pay tax on the interest not paid on the debt. So the quicker you can pay it down, the the more money you're making, right? At best, let's just say that you go and, you know, if you have got debt and you've never been investing before and you go and put your money in an index fund or something, and let's just say that it, it does 10% per year, well, you're going to pay tax on that 10% and net seven, whereas you could pay 10% down on your debt and, and actually clear 10%, if that makes sense. So debts, if you've got high debts, get them paid off. And the two methods that I recommend for doing that um, is one is the uh, avalanche method and one is the snowball method. And these are not something I've made up. You know, Dave Ramsey talks about these. If you heard of Dave Ramsey, um, the snowball method is essentially picking the smallest debt first. If you've got like a store card and an IOU and some other credit card, you pick the smallest one first, right? And you put as much on that as possible and you pay all the minimum payments on the others, right? And every month you pay as much as you can on that until it's gone. And then you take that whole lump sum that you've been paying every month and you add it to the next one as if you're still paying that amount, right? And then it just compounds. And then you take that one that's paid off to the next one until you're paying like a lot of money per month on the last one, but you you smash it down really quickly. That has a very, very high success rate because of the way that it's structured. It, it's not even the, the cheapest way of doing it. The cheapest way is the avalanche method, whereas you pay down the, the biggest APR debt first. The snowball one has a higher success rate just because of human psychology and the way that mm -hmm. we like to tick things off and see things getting paid down. Uh, whereas the high interest ones, you know, they're not very motivating because it's like, oh God, I'm not getting anywhere. So although it's cheaper to do it that way, I highly recommend that you check out the snowball method. That's point three. Point two is this whole process of your expenses. Uh, really get excited about doing this um this uh exercise and it's recognize prioritize optimize that's what you want to do with your expenses recognize prioritize optimize and what it is is a process of going through your bank statements right this is where it's going to force you to be uncomfortable but it's time like if you've got negative views towards money or you get triggered when you talk about money or someone says you know I paid my kids this that much that this much pocket money this week and that triggers you a little bit it's time to face this in the in the you know in the eyes and grab it by the horn so you print out your bank statements and make an exercise of it family exercise of it bring your kids into it your husband wife whatever just go through and go right what are first of all what are we paying out second of all highlight anything that's a hot spot so what a hotspot is, is something that's a lot higher than you thought. So you might mm -hmm. go through and you go, bloody hell, coffee, you know, <laughs> four pound of coffee, but actually 80 pounds a month on coffee. That would be a yeah. hotspot. It's like, wow, I didn't realize it was that much. Gardener or someone, you know, it's like, well, they come around every now and then trim the hedges, 400 pound a month or whatever, right? And it's like, bloody hell. Um, you know, you might have, so all the hotspots are going to be relative to you and, and your mm -hmm. situation, but be aware of them, get them, get them down. Right. Um, sky, all that kind of stuff. Also, when you're doing this exercise, highlight what one is a debt, right? So, you know, what one's a debt 
and you want to keep your debt to income ratio below 10%. And what your debt to income ratio is, is it has a direct correlation to your mental well-being. It is literally, uh, in fact, the word wealth comes from an old English word, welle, which means well-being. And your debt to income ratio will have a direct impact on your mental health. And it's not always visible. It's, you don't even know why. But it's essentially how much you're earning goes towards paying a debt. And if that's a very high percentage, you're going to feel stressed. You're going to be snapping at your partner, short with your kids. You're going to be a terrible colleague, boss, partner, stuff. Your whole life starts to go to, to put the higher you go in that percentage, right? So you want to make sure you're keeping that ideally below 20%, but even better below 10%. So that's the recognized bit, right? The next thing is the prioritize. So what you want to do is pri come up with a way of prioritizing how you're going to make savings on these things, okay? I don't know if anyone's heard of the Eisenhower matrix, but it's basically a little matrix cross of four where you put all the things in a, in a, in a box to prioritize how you're going to do it. And the first matrix that I run them through these, these um, expenses is critical, not critical, highly valued or not highly valued. Okay. I'll give you an example. So you find one of your little hot spots on your bank. Or maybe you bloody hell, we're spending like 80 quid on the cinema and 70 quid on popcorn. Going to the cinema with your family might be a highly valued thing, right? So you might love that time of your family. So it's highly valued, right? Um, but it's not critical, right? So you've got a decision. What, what I would suggest is anything that's highly valued, but not critical, you reduce. So maybe you just go once a, a, a month and not you know, or once every two months instead of once a month. Um, it might be a takeaway or a, a family meal out that might be really valuable to you because you all get to converse around the dinner table because you don't have your kids on iPads and all that kind of stuff, right? And uh, and and that's a valuable family time. And it's like, but it's not critical. So maybe see if you can, you know, order a few less drinks or set a limit to the to the thing so that you've got it under control. Maybe do it once a once a fortnight instead of once a week and so on, right? If it's um if it's really critical but not highly valued, okay, like I uh, try and give give an example. Um life insurance, <laughs> like okay, that's 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 valued. I don't know, some kind of insurance or some kind of like something you just don't like paying for, but you know it's critical. Well, then what you can do is any of those you want to negotiate or um gets like get someone else to do it delegate it if you can because those things are gonna are gonna trigger you a little bit if it's really valuable and it's really critical then you want to keep it obviously um and if it's not critical and not valuable cancel it cancel it off if you don't watch sky tv and and you know now's a really important time to run these these uh matrixes as well um so that's a really good exercise. The next matrix to run it through is like the greatest savings versus the complexity. So if you've got to go into your bank to make the saving, right, that's going to be quite a complex thing. Um, and if you're only going to save £10 a month, it's probably not the great, you know, that's do that last kind of thing. Um, if you can make a, a really great saving and it's really easy to do, do those ones first. OK, and any ones that you can negotiate that are coming up, put it in your calendar on the 6th of January 2024. We can negotiate this life insurance policy. I've got to put some time in the diary to like ring them and go through that kind of stuff. Right. And this is a matrix you want to do on a yearly basis, like it, because no matter how many times I've done this, your expenses start creeping up again and you take on a subscription and you take on this thing and that thing. And who does this in business? Right. If you've got your own business. All these little softwares is oh that looks like a nice shiny object and you get all these things and all of a sudden you're racking up all these death by a thousand cuts right all these little tiny little costs it's like right we need to we need to do this again and we need to run it through all that and you go through and make it fun make it part of your business part of your life um you know it's it's bring it to the bring it to the table 
and and be really close to your numbers um so that's the that's the uh the prioritize part of it nice. the next bit is optimize so believe it or not you can actually make money from this doing this and the way that you do that is imagine that you've just acclimatized to spending this money right which some of you have some of you are not in shit street right but you're yeah all right you're on a bit of a hamster wheel but you're not really fretting and you're paying all this money out but all of a sudden you've recognized what you're spending imagine if you made all the savings and this is kind of a little bit of homework for the group i guess it'd be great to know how much you've prioritized saving or how many savings you've made and how much money that equates to that'd be a really good uh, thing to see in the comments um but now what you do, for some of you, obviously, and this is going to be harder today because we are seeing an increase in living costs and all the rest of it, and people just don't have any disposable at all. But first of all, it'd be good to know what percentage that you've saved. Second of all, it'd be good to see what monetary figure you've saved. But the next thing you do is you imagine you make the saving, but you put it in this fake bank, right? It's like you you stash it. So you make... £10 saving a month there, £90 saving a month there, £30 there, £20 there, right? And you might have £150, £200, £300, whatever it might be, £500. What you do, for some of you, is you then go and spend that money on development and growth and books and courses and mentorships and mastermind groups, right? And development, audible memberships. You go and read some books. You go and do a boot camp. You go and spend it on yourself. And what that does is it then allows you to earn more money because every penny that you spend on mentorship or coaches or some kind of program or some kind of self-development, you are going to earn more money. You're, it's just a byproduct of, of doing that, right? So I've, I've consciously put aside 10% of my income for self-development since I was 23. And that has served me every single year. So if you can do that, then all of a sudden you've used this exercise to save money and then earn more money, which is amazing. And it, it it's just this magic thing that just seems to happen every time. I, I haven't seen it not work because when you're, when you have this, it's very uncomfortable to take what you've saved and spend it on something that has an intangible outcome. Because it's, you know, whenever you spend money on self-development, believe it or not, you've got to actually do the work to mm -hmm. apply what you've learned. Um, and it's up to you to go and do that. So it's it's all on you. But when you're that uncomfortable and you spend it, you're going to get your money's worth. Like you're going to, you're the kid at the front, just keep asking questions. You know, that, that's, that's what I am anyway. Whenever I pay for anything, I'm like asking all the questions. I want my money's <laughs> worth. I want my money's worth. And I'm going to get the thing done. I'm going to get the thing done. <laughs> So uh, that's a that's a really great thing to do as well. So recognize, prioritize, optimize your expenses. At this point, you know what you're earning. You know you've got got a good outlook on money, good good mindset around money. You know what your number is that you've got in mind that you need to be financially independent. Um, you've sorted your debts out and you've got a plan for that. You've now gone through and got really close to your money by knowing exactly what's going in and out, all the hot spots. You're in control. You're now in control. It's not controlling you. It's not a you're not a slave to money anymore. You're actually a master uh, of your money. So the final step is to then set up your future income in a way that is fully automated and what i mean by that is at the moment most people just have one bank and they all their income goes into one bank and they splurge the income out right into oblivion no one really knows except you do now because you know exactly what you're doing in fact this will probably be really really easy for me to share can i share the screen or just a yeah, yeah 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 go for it you should be able to this is going to be, uh, this would probably be the easiest way to kind of tie all this off nicely together. Um, and it'll all make sense, I hope. Let me spotlight you as well so you come up. Right. I'm just going to share the, uh, 
Oh, it's not going to come up, is it? Um, here we go. There you go. Right, just give me a couple of secs and it should share. Come on, tech. <laughs> come on. Be good to us. It is thinking about it. It's loading. Let me know in the comments if you're uh, if you had any light bulb moments or turning points uh, on this. I'd be interested to see. I definitely think that there will have been because actually, I really like the way it's been framed to be in control rather than feeling out of control, like feeling like money owns you rather than you yeah. own it. Um, and actually knowing your numbers is how you'll feel empowered and you'll be able to set an action plan. Whereas, yeah, it's easy to, it's easy to shy away from it. Absolutely. I just realized that Zoom have this uh, whiteboard feature, so I can use that instead. Uh, oh, there we go. Probably not going to be as pretty, but here we go. So at the moment, if you imagine these buckets, right? Because we talk about money in terms of liquidity, right? And this bucket represents your bank. Okay, so I'll put bank here, right? And for most people, they have one of these buckets, which is their bank account, and the money comes in. Oh, look at this. I should have been a should have been a doctor. So for most people, they have the money that comes into here from their job or whatever. And they feel this, but there's a there's a kind of crack in this and it splurges out and they don't really control what's going on here. It just splurges out and they buy the takeaways and the thing, which now you've got control of, right? And this, we'll call this bucket here, your expenses. And I'm not going to write expenses, but what I will write is L-E, right? Your living expenses or lifestyle expenses. Now what you've done, essentially by doing what I've just told you, is you've got this tap here, and you've controlled this tap to control the flow of your expenses. So when the money comes in here, the idea is you start filling this up, okay? And you only let out here exactly what you need. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, my advice to you is to make sure that you try to aim to get three at least three to six months living costs just stashed here. Now, I know that for some of you, that could take a year. For some of you, it could take two years. I promise you there's a direct return, like an immediate return on investment from doing that. You think differently. You see opportunities better. You become more calm, more caring, because you know that if the crap hit the fan, three months, you're all right. Six months, you're all right, right? So you want to build up a what I call a cash buffer or a cushion. Uh, in here, which is three to six times this, okay? But now you've controlled this, and over here, what you've got is your savings. So every time that you get paid, you also want a little tap here that then puts money over into here. And this is your liquid assets, all right? So this is your savings, your savings account. Wow. Go on, Zoom. Uh, this is where you save. So every time you get paid, you automatically siphon off a tiny piece of that, 5%, 10%, whatever you can start with, and you automatically deploy it into another account. So these are separate accounts. If anyone banks with Monzo, Tired, Starling, any of those online banks, you can set up spaces in the app which act as separate sub-accounts. So you can pay bills from one sub-account. You can do your something else from another account. You can pay something from your other account, right? So you have your main account where your income comes into from your job, and then you split it into these separate accounts. So you might have a tax one as well, right? But really, we just want to focus on three, your main one, your uh, savings, and your living costs, okay? Now, here's what you, here's what, here's where you want to get, like, here's what you want to think about working towards, okay? Once you've got the liquidity built up in here, this is what you can spend a tiny amount of on your self-development, okay? Now, your self-development 
if you spend a little bit of money on your self-development, what this does, self-development, this actually has an impact on your income because one, it can make you more efficient at your job. It could get you a pay rise if you read how to be a better manager or leader or whatever it is, right? So it has a direct impact on that, which of course increases the flow here, which increases the flow here, which you can raise your lifestyle costs if you want, but you just tweak that tap and live within your means. And the other beauty about this bit is you can develop more leveraged income streams. So let's just say that now you've got some savings and you've got some liquidity, you can go and start investing this, right? And compounding this where it grows and grows and grows and grows and grows by buying stocks or investing in other businesses or doing other stuff with it, right? And you start using this money to grow until the point where one day you just open a tap here and this starts paying you, which then replaces this. And then you have an infinite money cycle, which grows and grows and grows and grows and requires less of your time and less of your space. So the final point is to set separate bank accounts and automate as much of this as you can so that you are controlling your money this way. So you're siphoning off 10% here, right? 10% into self-development, ideally. Some people can't do that, but some people can. And then controlling your lifestyle costs. So you build up this little liquidity system here. You let that flow over into here, and then you go and buy other uh, assets, okay? Assets are how you create leveraged income. And there's only two different types of assets. Assets that you buy, like a stock or a, a rental property or something like that, or a, a business, um, or that you create. So very efficient, delegatable income streams like online businesses or you know assets, software, an app, some kind of um, digital online product that you've created that you can really keep lean and outsource most of the legwork and you just, your hands off you know, these assets that you create. Some people create businesses and outsource everything and take a minimal amount from the business. And then they go and do that again and again and again. And they take a little piece of a bigger pie. But who cares? You've got the money passively, right? Leveraged. So hope that makes sense with this disgusting drawing that I've done on the Zoom whiteboard. But that is, in a picture, the end game. That's the goal. And when you do that and you complete that, you'll have more free time, more money. Um, and I kind of, the last point I'll make is, it's a quote that I love. And it is when you value your time more than you value your money, you end up with plenty of both. And you have to value your time. It's not like I might get hit by a bus tomorrow. So you might as well spend the money while you got it. That is not in like, that is not the way to look at money. Because that's, who cares? Like, who, that's, that's not relevant at all. Money provides you time. So if you really enjoy life, you want as much time to do what you want instead of being at work, right? And then getting hit by a bus. <laughs> I'd rather get hit by a bus doing things that I love. <laughs> so, so I oh, hope that's not. kind of invaluable <laughs> to you guys. And uh, yeah, I'd love to hear any questions in the comments if there's any, or Laura, if you want to take it away. Yes, well, that was super valuable. So thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, a few questions, right? So do do you believe that everybody can work to this strategy and this model? Because you know there'll be some ladies in the group who might be single mums who are maybe yeah. already working one, two, three jobs, and yeah. they maybe hear something like passive income, and they're thinking to themselves, like, what? How would that? fit into my life you know what what would you yeah. what would be the advice for a lady in that position yeah so all of the points that i went through are in order and you know the first step is to get to to take the the burden and the negativity away from money by doing these first steps so just knowing your numbers okay for some people that's going to be very very uh, uninspiring and for some people it's going to be quite depressing but it's the first step. And at the moment, you've got this, 
you know, I've got someone in my mind who just do- who doesn't want to look at it because they just don't want to know. It you'll feel better by taking that step to get closer to it to then go right. Let's now we know what we've got. Now we know how far behind we are or, or whatever, right? So that really is the first step. The second step is to not worry about passive income or think about any of that stuff. The the next step is to make sure <clears throat> that um you have gone through all of your expenses and you've mm-hmm. you know you've cut those down. Ask people who could help, who could you help, right? So for some people, it's like, well, what are you paying for? And could you get that cheaper? Or could you get it for free? And could you help them in some way? You know, what could, like, if you're, if the gardener, have you, do you share the window cleaning or do you share the, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of some situation where you could actually do a, like a, a rotor where you, you chip in and get mm-hmm. something or, ask someone for help um, and help them, you know, um, don't be afraid in times like these, everyone's going to be in need of some help for something, everyone. Yeah. So how can you help them? Um, Start asking those questions and and going, right. I'm really struggling with this. Um, I need to tell someone about just tell someone about it and then go, right. How can I, how can I maybe ease this a little, you know, how can I help someone to reduce this or how could I do a favor for someone to help in, improve this situation? Um, I, I appreciate people working all sorts of different jobs and everything, but again, knowing that time for money thing, like how can you do it more efficiently? How can you serve whoever you're working for at a higher level? Um, how can you prove your worth on one job rather than working three, you know, ask for a promotion, ask for more money because everyone, everyone in this situation wants good staff and good people that show up. And when it, when we get to recessions and things like this, as an, as an, an employer, you know, you just want people that are reliable. That's all you want. And if you're a reliable person, ask for more money, just go like, I'm really struggling. I need more money then they're probably going to say yes. You know, they, they really, if you're a valuable person, they'll probably say yes. Uh, Cause they would rather keep you. Um, so ask for more money, get on top of your money, control your expenses. Um, yeah. And just and start, guess, start, be- uh, start becoming a master of it instead of a, a scared of it. Yeah. And I, I think absolutely your process takes people right through feeling empowered about it and then maybe having the confidence to ask the boss for more money and if like you said like the self-development thing you know some people are right in the thick of it and they already do it and then for some people they've not even they might not even think oh well what is self-development for me but actually if you are investing a wee bit of money in self-development then that gives you even more tools and confidence to progress I always say to myself you know with the ggc business somebody will maybe say to me you know uh you know it's growing how how is it you know how have you got the growth in the business and i'll say because of the personal growth so i always listen to the podcasts and uh, maybe do the odd course and 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 it's the personal development that's brought on my business and my ideas for growing it so i like what you said there about the 10 percent um putting that towards your own growth and actually I think when humans are in a a state of learning it's so good for their their mental health as well yeah yeah absolutely what you don't want to do in in, if you're in a kind of a state of 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 poverty I I call it poverty because I think poverty is relative it's like when you can't when you're struggling to afford your own like comforts which you've acclimatized to you start to go into this kind of animal brain uh, poverty mode. And first of all, being in control of your finances will start to ease that. But what you don't want to be doing is going to try and learn some kind of get rich quick system. Um, That's the least time that you're going to be able to learn those because when you're in that animal brain mode, that poverty mode, your IQ actually drops, which means that it's very difficult to focus and learn skills um which you know which 
are required of you if you're going to go into those get rich quick systems because there are you know there are certain vehicles that will make you more money no doubt than others but you won't be able to learn them because of where you're at in your mind it's like if you can't afford to put food on the table i get people asking me to teach them to trade you know it took me three years to learn to trade and i was pretty in a good place when i when i learned if you can't afford your bills and your food learning to trade is the last thing you should be thinking about it's it's you won't be able to learn it. You won't have the ability to approach something like that, to make logical decisions every day. Like it, you just won't be able to do it. So it is a process, it, but you, 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 we're all on this journey, right? It's, everyone's on the same journey to become financially free. Everyone wants to do it. Very small amount of people do it. And it's because they do it in the wrong way. They build this kind of, they, they chase this next thing, next thing. The quicker you start working on this stuff and start, controlling it and being in control the quicker you'll get to where you want to be and the more enjoyable the whole thing will be as well uh i know for some people it doesn't you know you're not going to believe that and you're not going to you're going to say well no you know it's not for me but i promise you um i've worked with thousands of people and um it's always the same people start feeling motivated start feeling good about it and and uh yeah they become inspired to to keep going nice okay well actually you said there you've worked with lots of people and one of my friends has actually just messaged me to say how, how can we learn more <laughs> from you so do you how what, can you learn more how can people get closer to yeah, you look I, if if you're listening to this and you're tuning into this you are already into self-development right so you know i'm talking to people who have spent an hour of their monday night on a call like this learning and absorbing so you are if you're still here and you haven't said i'll oh, fuck that guy you know <laughs> then you're already good enough you're already uh, good enough to be working on this stuff so what i recommend is you can go out and check out my podcast which is called always free and start at episode one and in the first kind of 20 episodes of that podcast i'll share with you a lot of tangible practical tips that you can go and apply immediately and start to really get excited about the concept of of becoming financially free a lot of people don't think it's possible for the average person but it absolutely is you know freedom and financial freedom is is available to everyone who decides that they they're going to go for it and uh in that podcast i'll give you as many practical tips as i possibly can to to help you get there and uh, and if you're a more of a kind of newsletter type person, you can go to jasongraystone.com and, um, and and find me there. What I will say though, Laura, is if you just go straight to like socials, Instagram and all that, there's like hundreds of fake accounts of me and they'll be messaging you. So if you get all of my social media from jasongraystone.com, they'll be the official um, links. Interesting. I did notice that actually. So I'm glad you said that. Right, okay. Get all the social media from jasongraystone.com yeah yeah otherwise okay. they'll be asking you to send crypto to their wallets and things and yeah it's disgusting oh right okay well thank you so much for your time jason maybe we could do something a wee Thanks bit down the me. line because i know that a few people have messaged me about investing and trading i know that you said three years you took to learn it maybe that's something a wee bit down the line because again that's the type of thing that puts yeah. fear into me but i know that it can be powerful for accumulating, you know, accumulating wealth. I know a lot of people that do it for their children and, you know, for the future. So, yes, maybe we could have a, a, wee, a wee separate conversation. But as for tonight, that's been brilliant. That's been a really good to follow process whereby ladies and people that watch this can hopefully feel a wee bit more empowered about their finances to know what their plan is moving forward. So thank you yeah, for taking amazing. the time. Thanks for having me on. No problem at all. I'm going to stop the stream now. So night everyone for watching. And if anyone's got any questions thereafter, I can always send them over to Jason. But thank you very much for tuning in. Good night. Thanks, guys.